Good morning. Welcome to All Souls UU Church of Belleville and Gambier, Ohio. Welcome to our online service today. Today, we are blessed to have our beloved Dr. Walter Kenya speaking, and, and we're, I'm, we're really glad that you're here with us today. We have a few birthdays to celebrate. Happy birthday to Joyce Fenton on the 5th, Bambi Gordon on the 7th, Kelly Malk on the 8th, and Olivia Humphrey on the 9th. Our, as we begin our service, our prelude is an interesting one. It's the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and it's a piece that can mean a lot of things. An anti, anti-white supremacy song, a soldier song concerning an immigrant, John Brown. African-American units sang it while serving and poet and Unitarian Julia Ward Howe formalized the lyrics that we know most. It's a war song that at best is about freedom and liberation. And at worst, it's about projecting one's own perspective and claiming that God is the one ordaining it. Glory, hallelujah. As a UU, I think of it as our Muslim siblings teach with the concept of Ummah, the mission to build community based on justice, equity, and compassion. Beloved community, as we pause before this service begins, let us think about the long past, about the role each of us play in building beloved community, the empathy needed, the connection, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Wherever you are, wherever you are listening to this, wherever you're joining us, we ask, light a candle. We light, light a candle today as a, as a chalice, as a symbol of our faith, as a means to liberation, a call for freedom, a call for justice, a call for peace within and peace throughout. As the light sends waves through our room, let it be waves of joy, waves of peace, waves of immaculate love.
May it be so. Our first hymn today was, is performed by the UU 2020 GA Choir called Tomorrow. And in recent days, it has offered me comfort. The lyrics are, I am already under. Let the waves wash over me. There will be better days. Please rise in body and spirit and sing with us. better days there will be 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 better days We come together now to form a church. A church is where we share our thoughts and our feelings and our milestones. We share a piece of ourselves. This is our time for joys and concerns. Sometimes it makes us feel vulnerable, and it is right and proper to share these at church. 
with the lives of our, of our church family. Feel free to share via Facebook as I light a candle for our joys and for our concerns. Feel free to write a letter to someone to share, to share your mind, to share your thoughts. And after the service, call someone up and listen and hear their story. This is the foundation of a church, this, this, the network of people. And we light our candles of joys and concerns. Amen. Maybe so. Let us prepare to, to make an offering. We reflect on the many accomplishments of this congregation, and we look forward to what is to come. The gifts that you offer, are, we are truly thankful. Please send your gift or benevolence to all souls at 25 Church Street, Belleville, Ohio. 44813. You can also donate electronically using the Tithely app. This is both on Android and iPhone. The offering is, is graciously received. Thank you. Will you pray with me? Will you meditate with me? So let's sit back. Remember to breathe. Pause. To share your breath with somebody is an intimate act. Let your muscles relax. Notice the seat you're sitting on. Gently close your eyes and concentrate. And our prayer today comes from Mary Oliver's poem, Sometimes. Instructions for living a life. Pay attention. Be astonished. And tell about it. Two or three times in my life, I've discovered love. Each time seemed to solve everything. And each time, it solved a great many things. But not everything. It left me as grateful as if, if it had indeed and thoroughly solved everything. Amen. Today, we welcome Dr. Walter Kenya to, to share his thoughts with us and be present with us. Dr. Kenya. Well, good morning, everybody. As I was sitting listening to Will speak, it was kind of an unusual experience for me to be sitting and looking at the church organ. And what's fascinating about it for me is the fact that I in the 54 years that I have been coming here to the UU Church to speak, I've never had the opportunity to sit in the congregation and see the organ's pipes. Fascinating experience, beautiful experience. But I want to welcome you to a period of chaos. 
And it doesn't require much explanation because everyone's living through it. But I'd like to provide a bit of reassurance about the nature of chaos. That it serves a very positive purpose. And while it's inconvenient for us, it actually lays the groundwork for a new dimension of order. Progress in human life. It kind of realizes or helps us to realize that we are all connected. And if we ignore that reality, then we pay a phenomenal price. So it's reassuring to know that there is a purpose in what we're going through today. What I'd like to spend our time on today is a thing I call a spiritual awakening. When you think about that, what would be a good definition of the word that we call life? Well, there are a lot of different approaches we could take to describing it, but I'd like to call it or describe it as a process of spiritual awakening. And the resources that I would use to understand that process are two. One of them would be one of my predecessors in my own profession, by the name of Dr. Carl Jung, and his description of a word called synchronicities, or what he may also call meaningful coincidences. The second would be a novel, and perhaps you've read it before, the novel called The Celestine Prophecy, and it's written by James Redfield. It's a classic in human behavior, and it's a classic in spirituality. It's also telling us what are the issues that are important in life. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend that you read it. But if you have read it, I'd suggest that maybe you'd find it really helpful because you're in a totally different place in life today than you were when you read it. And reading it would have additional meaning for you and even greater depth in the experience of going through it. So for Dr. Carl Jung, what is a synchronicity? Well, he would probably describe it as a mysterious, seemingly unrelated set of events in our lives that kind of tug us or direct us toward a certain kind of a destiny. And it would also take us to what, again, I would call a spiritual awakening, which is moving beyond one's preoccupation with the ego and a materialistic worldview, which is maintained by the majority part of the world today. One of the things that I find to be fascinating is the experience of aging. Aging does something for us that nothing else can do. It makes it possible for us to review one's life and begin to see how seemingly disconnected or unrelated events have created a pattern for us that resulted in our becoming who we are and how we managed to end up where we are in our life experience. This book, The Celestine Prophecy, is a novel. It came out in the year of 1998 and was written by James Redfield. And it was a New York Times bestseller for two years, back in 1995 and 1996. In the novel, it creates a story much like the Da Vinci Code, which is full of historical truth, spiritual truth, and metaphysical truth that's buried in a storyline. And the beautiful part of that is the fact that it's a storyline makes it easy to read and stay interested. But what's it about? It's a story of a party of people searching for an ancient manuscript in Peru. And this is a very unique manuscript because it contains insights, actually nine of them, that impacts human life and one's spiritual journey. 
And this group was devoted to find out what those insights were. The searchers in the novel are sought out by the government of Peru and by the church that exists in Peru at the time. Because the discovery of those insights is a tremendous threat to both the government and the church who have a concern to maintain power and control over the thoughts and the lives of the people. And what the novel does is connect the dots of the person's metaphysical experience. It tells how nature's energy, how metaphysics and human behavior are all intertwined, how everything is brought together, how what quantum, quantum physics tells us today, how we are all connected. So it addresses this human quest for what we call love, for meaning, and for spiritual evolution. We make use of this word metaphysics a lot in today's world, but what actually is metaphysics? It's a study of what's above and beyond material or matter, or what's physical. It's a branch of philosophy that deals with the nature of reality. You could say it's kind of a study of first principles, talking about the nature of existence and what our human experience is here in this life. It talks about consciousness, and it talks about the nature of existence. Well, there's nine insights in the book that provide a very clear path to what our spiritual awakening is all about. There's a vast system of energy that exists in the world, and that energy responds to how we think. Now, that's a concept that may be new to a lot of people, not realizing that what's going on in our minds is affecting everything that's happening in the world. All the control dramas that play out, how we exchange energy. And in the Celestine Prophecy, there's a focus on what Dr. Carl Jung calls these synchronicities or meaningful coincidence. So what was the message of coincidences? Well, there are a lot of them that are in my life and I can share a few of them that I think are kind of interesting. <clears throat> it was kind of a normal thing for our family growing up to take out a weekend and go to Cedar Point, spend a couple of nights in a motel, and have fun at Cedar Point. So one weekend, uh, we did make reservations to stay at a Holiday Inn. And at that particular Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, I walked up to the reservation desk and indicated that I wanted to check in for our reservation. And the clerk said to me, well, you're already checked in. She said, what's your name? I said, well, it's Kenia, K-A-N-I-A. I said, okay. I said, Walter? I said, yes. She said, Dr. Walter? I said, yes. She said, you're already checked in. I said, no, I, I just walked up to the reservation desk now. She said, well, I'm sorry, but you're already in room 123. Well, I said, there's something wrong here. So I went to room 123 and met myself. In Cleveland, there was a dentist by the name of Walter Kania. How unusual is that? And it was Dr. Walter Kania, and he had decided that he and his wife and his three children were going to spend the weekend at Cedar Point. And they walked in about 30 minutes before I did and took our reservation. Well, that was a coincidence, a very meaningful coincidence. And there was a message about it, which we could get into, but I'd rather not spend the time on that now. So we had a chance to visit and talk about similarities between our names and all of that. 
But uh, there are a lot of other, other examples of what synchronicities are all about, because they occur in life on a regular basis. There's a story about the two men who were in a large supermarket shopping, but when their carts kind of collided, and one said to the other, you know, I'm really sorry. I was just kind of staring around looking for my wife. The other man said, well, what a coincidence. I, I was looking for my wife, too. And I was getting a little desperate because I couldn't find her. Well, the first man said, well, maybe I can help you. What does your wife look like? The first man said, well, she's five foot three. Uh, but she has uh, blonde hair, sparkling blue eyes, a bus line of about 42 inches, and a very curvaceous figure. What does your wife look like? The other man said, well, never mind. Let's look for yours. Well, <laughs> that's kind of awakening to our ego sense or our sensual self. And it's not the same type of awakening that I wanted to focus on today. There's another example of synchronicities, many examples for me in my life. And let me share a couple of them that occurred as I moved through my life. I'm 18 years old, a sophomore at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. It was 10.30 at night and I had left campus and I was walking through a, a dark alley in town in Oxford. I had left my fraternity house and I was going back to my own room, uh, which was just off campus. Very clear night, the stars are shining very brightly. And I, I kind of stopped because it was so clear. And I looked up at the stars and uh, I kind of pondered what the universe might really be like. Well, I felt very small as I looked at the vastness of the stars. And I felt very alone. I even felt a little frightened. And I was frightened not because it was dark or because I was by myself, although those both might have contributed a little bit. But what I felt was because I knew where I was. What I didn't know is why I was. How did I fit into this immensely large scheme of what we call the universe? It was kind of like a story that I had read about in the book Life After Life by Dr. Raymond Moody. He talked about a professor friend of uh, Einstein's who had uh, a son at the University of Princeton. And this particular son so dejected and, and depressed that he kind of refused to continue his studies or to do anything else. Kind of became dysfunctional. Well, what was the trouble? Was he worried about dying? About life? No. He was concerned about the death of the solar system. Someday, he said, it will all go to pieces, and then what? Everything accomplished on the planet would go for naught. It would be as if nothing had ever happened here at all. So why bother doing anything? Here again was a focus on the material universe. From a strictly ego or material point of view, the lad was right. He had likely absorbed a Newtonian, Newtonian mechanical view of the universe and a very limited view of life, consisting of nothing more than the physical body having experiences. He had no idea of the essence of who he was, or even the question of why he was. He little realized the importance of using our life in time and space to learn to evolve. He knew nothing of the fact that there is no death of our essence or that our, the fact that our life really does continue. He had no knowledge of the amazing galaxies 
to which we may eventually evolve or even become masters. Any kind of limited worldview fills people with pessimism and despair. And even living in a time of chaos like we are now, it's good not to be depressed or despairing because something good is going to evolve from what's happening today. Limited worldviews always do that to people. So we need to expand our consciousness. Living in a box temporarily kind of gives us comfort, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I, I think that I like to think about somebody like Jonathan Livingston Siegel, who wanted to expand his wings and to soar, or as Joseph Campbell says, to begin to live blissfully. That's worthwhile. I knew that when I was a freshman at Miami University, I was there to learn. But I had no idea of how, how all of that fell into my life. At 18, I didn't have enough experience or exposure or learning to understand who I was, why I was here, or what my life mission happened to be. But I have a lot more insight into that as now. It's as if Joseph Campbell had said, I am here to experience being a human being is time and space and to make it blissful. I'm here to evolve to an even more higher level of consciousness for continued life in this vast universe. Because I have now realized that I have always existed. That I, am, I was never born. And that I will never die. And lastly, that I have awakened. I know that I was, that I am now, and will always be a part of the universe and others beyond. But there was another coincidence in my life, and they kept on happening, and they created a pattern that I began to see very clearly. As a sophomore at Miami University, gazing into the heavens, I never realized that my next year, I would find a freshman co-ed at Ohio State who was taking a course in astronomy. Little did I know that her interest in astronomy and the nature of the universe or that she and I would travel into a new realm of consciousness together for the next 60 plus years of our life. That was what you might call a meaningful coincidence or a synchronicity. And it was only later in our relationship that I came to appreciate all of that transcendence that astronomy gives us and what metaphysics tells us and represents for our life. There was still another synchronicity or meaningful coincidence, a, a spiritual phenomena that was identified by Dr. Carl Jung. And this one takes me back to my first year at Miami. It was 1950, and it's important. It was freshman week at Miami University in Oxford. And I was there to major in business. I was going to study labor and industrial relations because I was going to law school and become an attorney. At the time, I didn't know exactly why. Well, my dad was a teamster. My uncles were United Steel workers. And I had a maternal aunt who was a guiding light in my life, who was the executive secretary to the president of a large public relations firm in Cleveland, Ohio. And I would one day work for this firm in Cleveland, in my mind. I even interviewed with the president before going to law school at Ohio State, where I had already been admitted. But I first had to complete a commitment to finish pilot training 
and commit myself to eight years in the United States Air Force. Back to freshman year at Miami. It was an afternoon and classes had not begun and I had nothing to do. So I walked downtown Oxford, very small place, to a used bookstore because I did have time on my hands. The only thing that jumped out at me in that whole store was a book with the title, Abnormal Psychology. I was a high school student in 1950. I had never even heard of the word about the field of psychology. I had not yet had any college classes, but I bought the book. I took it home and I read it. 70 years later, here I am, having completed a professional career in the field of psychology after all of those prior years of planning a different professional career. That book and my life are what I call a meaningful coincidence or a synchronicity. So we talk about synchronicities. It's the occurrence of two events that are related and meaningful with no apparent causal relationship in any physical manner. It's a chain of events with no apparent cause in physical reality. It's little miracles through which an unseen consciousness presents itself in our lives. Something seemingly unrelated occurs that has special meaning. It's a place or an event where the inner world meets the outer world with no apparent causal connection. You might even say that a synchronicity or a meaningful coincidence is what we call a spiritual awakening. They occur in many different ways. A spiritual awakening can occur through an accident, through an illness, through a health issue, through a trauma, through a loss of a friend or a family member, through a near-death experience, through whatever may remind us of our mortality or the limited amount of time we have in this time and space. So a spiritual awakening is an expansion or a shift in our consciousness. It's becoming aware of realities and parts of oneself that might have been previously hidden from our consciousness. James Redfield's and my goal is that of aiding us in coming to realize who it is that we really are. Who we really are is citizens of two worlds simultaneously. We are living in the realm of two dimensions. Most people think that we live in only one, that of the physical. And we do live in the physical temporarily. But our sense dimension is not what is real. And A Course in Miracles tells us that and calls it an illusion or a dream. We have to develop an ego in order to live in this material world of the five senses. And normally that ego serves us very well. But unless that ego lives in service to the reality of the spiritual, we get very lost. And what we always need to remember are the words of the physicist, Dr. Max Planck. There is no matter as such. Any time that coincidence become connected, they become meaningful and almost mysterious. And these meaningful coincidences give us information that there's another side and a deeper meaning to what life is all about. So a spiritual awakening is realizing that it is not the material realities that matter. It's the spiritual forces 
that are at work in our lives are what it is that it is real. How do we come to feel secure? And security is important, but it comes not from what we have, but from knowing who it is, who we are. And we happen to be the same as stardust, spiritual beings having a human experience. A spiritual awakening places us in this higher state of consciousness about life and about the world in which we live. So what we see happening in our world is a new synthesis of physics, psychology, of mysticism, and of spirituality. People and events appear in our lives are there for a reason and for a purpose. And none of them are there by accident. Thank you very much. Please rise and body as an embodying spirit, as willing and able for our last hymn. Let us close this service with the words of one of our great covenants written by Reverend Blake. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek truth and love and to help one another. Thank you for being here today and um, go in peace. Our postlude is old Joe Clark. Have a great day.